A legendary psychopathic murderer stalks the summer camp, killing anyone who utters his name. Join Billy Graves, the godfather of Joel James, Final Girl Casey, and me, Memphis Menace Rick, for the 1982 slasher Madman. But don't dare say the name Madman Mars. Oh shit! Goody camp run, ain't ya? with a man who used to live in that old dilapidated house behind those trees. We're not supposed to be this close to it because uh, many strange things happen around here. He was a farmer with his family, wife and two children. He was an evil man. Ugly and mean. He'd beat his wife and brutally punish his children. He'd drink at the tavern and... <laughs> fight all the time. He once had a piece of his nose bitten off in a brawl and didn't feel a thing. It was a night like tonight, many, many years ago. Wait a minute. Now that I think about it, it was the same night as tonight. The woods, quiet and dark. The farmer, for no apparent reason, went stark, raving mad. He walked into his bedroom with an axe in his hand and chopped his sleeping wife into little pieces. Then, with his bloodlust awakened, he walked down the hall to his son's room and took an axe to him, and he still wasn't finished. He walked across the hall to his daughter's room, and without so much as a word, he chopped her into little pieces, too. Then, he calmly walked into the tavern, lifted the bloody axe onto the bar, and ordered himself a beer. Well, it wasn't long before the town found out what happened, and when it did, it was all over for the mad farmer, or so they thought. Ten men jumped him and dragged him screaming to the nearest tree, where they quickly looped a thick rope around his neck and hoisted him high into the air. One of them grabbed the bloody axe and swung it at the farmer's head, leaving a deep, bloody gash on the side of his face. They left him there, hanging for dead. Next morning, when they went to cut him down, he was gone. It was then they noticed the bodies of his wife and children were missing, and their bodies have never been found. Oh, Max, come on. How could their bodies never be found? I mean, where could they be? I don't know, Richie. All I do know is that on certain nights, when the moon is full, he's out there stalking in the woods, searching for people so he can chop their heads off with an axe or hang them from a tree. You're trying to be funny or something. What's this farmer's name anyway? Huh, Richie, I have a good reason I haven't told you his name. A very good reason. You see, it is said also that if you say his name above a whisper in the woods, he will hear you because he can be anywhere, anytime. And if he hears you call his name, he'll come for you. And if he comes for you, he'll get you. One by one, you'll start to fall before night's over. I'll get you all. His name is Mad Mad Mars. What do you say? I couldn't hear him. His name is Mars. Mad Mad Mars. Hey, Mars! Mad Mad Mars! Here we are! Come and get us, Mad Mad! Richie, now you've done it. Don't you realize you're fooling with things beyond your control? The Madman Mars doesn't understand anymore. The Madman Mars thinks you're making fun of him. He didn't mean it, Mars! He's young and foolish. 
and doesn't know what he's doing. Stay where you are. We mean you no harm. Let's hope that stopped him in time. If not, no one is safe in the woods tonight. Anyone alone in the woods. You can't hear him. You can't see him. You smell this odor of death. And you turn around, and suddenly, this horribly mutilated face stares down at you. It's the last thing you see before zap! Off goes your head. I hope you enjoyed my little story. It's my way of saying goodbye and good luck to your children. Welcome to another episode of Slashers and Screamers. We are a presentation of Slasher Sports. And remember, this podcast does contain all the spoilers in the world. So if you want to smash that pause button, go check out the film. By all means, we're here waiting. <laughs> all right, stop messing around. Uh, the dialogue that you just heard was from the chilling tale told by Campfire Light in the words of head camp counselor Max. Guys, did Rick do a good job this week, or did Rick do a good job this week in picking this film? Am I supposed to say something here? Yes, James, there was a verbal cue there where, hey, did Rick do a good... That ends with a question mark. That's for you to give some input. Mad Martinez (laughs) was a pretty crazy flick. James, this is right up your alley, man. Right up your alley, a beastly ghoul kind of a fellow living in the woods. He, not he unlike no yourself. Beastly ghoul. He was pretty beastly. He you was a those, mad man. He was a mad man. Did you see those banana hands attached to those wrists? He had some kind of. He had some kind of claws. I don't know what was going on there. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just like when uh, your uncle Mitch doesn't trim his toenails. All right, guys, here to join us on our journey, looking back at this fantastic and quite underrated slasher. He's a B-movie and horror enthusiast, exploitation novel writer, and paranormal investigator. Welcome, Mr. Christopher Zisi. Uh, Billy, Rick, Casey, James, thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here with you guys. You know, just from the short time we've known each other, I, I think that we could all get together once a week for a beer and have a great time. We should arrange it. I don't think geographically it'd be too easy, but you never know what the future will bring. You know what? The thing about geographics is uh, the fact that the intro net, Al Gore's intro net is, right. uh, <laughs> is connecting us all. Yes. Um, I think it belongs to Dolly Parton now. I don't know, but could be. Yeah. Well, I mean, right out of the gate. So there's no confusion. Uh, many of the things you've written are uh, under a pen name, correct? Yes, of late. Um, I've written uh, five, almost six. Six is coming out maybe next month, uh, exploitation novels. Uh, They're meant to offend. They're meant to be bad. They're meant to have plot holes. They're meant to mirror those early 1970s straight-to-drive-in movies. Uh, They're they're meant to, uh, uh, like I said... uh, you know, I, I still use uh, the, the concept of microfiche. We've got to steal the microfilm. Uh, today, the modern moviegoer has no idea, but unless you watch those early 1970 uh, spy movies, you have no idea what microfilm is. Uh, and so it, it's sort of a throwback to the early 70s brought to modern times. But like I said, they're going to be villains who you hate, and they're going to be protagonists who might be equally as bad. But we put them all together and see what happens. Love that. You know, and I want to make sure that we can kind of maximize our ability to contribute. So let's tell everybody where they can find you on social media. Uh, Instagram and um, Twitter are the same address. At CJ Zizzy. That's CJ, Z as in zebra, I, S as in Sam, I. Uh, The blog is Zizzy Emporium for B-movies. It is zizzyemporium.blogspot.com. And those are the best places to find me on social media. However, I now, as a, since March, have another Twitter account, which is at Gunsler, and Gunsler is spelled G-U-N-S-S-L-E-R, and that's the exploitation uh, aspect of what I do. And I do have an exploitation movie blog. I put out a horror movie review every other day, 1600 since 2014. Uh, but now they are fast. Yeah, they are coming yeah. out fast. They do. They do. I, I don't golf. I don't hunt. I have no friends and nobody likes me. So <laughs> I get to watch movies all day. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so Thule Station, T-H-U-L-E Station dot com is my exploitation movie 
blog. Well, let's talk a minute about some of your work. Uh, I mean, you fully conceded that like what you write isn't for everyone. It, it's meant right. to be rude. It's meant to be crass. And w- yes. with projects such as Bikini Babes versus Vampires, Slaughter of the Danger Dames, and yes. the Tentacled Invasion, like I think folks yes. know what they're getting into. Okay, yes. we're gonna we're gonna have links in the bios yeah. of this episode, wherever you listen, and they'll lead you directly to these works. But uh, you said that you got something dropping soon. What, what can you tell us about it? Keep as much yeah, as you Shanghai need to under wraps. Sin. Yeah, Shanghai Sin um, is coming out. Uh, oh, I, it was originally scheduled for October. It looks like it's going to be mid-September. Um, I just went crazy with it. And um, it's uh, kind of a neat story. Uh, believe it or not, I've never been to Shanghai. I've been all over Asia, but I've never been to Shanghai. So I was doing a lot of research about the streets there, the alleys there, the red light district there, the trendy neighborhoods there. And there's a beautiful woman who's quite the enigma. And when she's coming down the street, you are instantly seduced. I know she gets close to you and she'll end up decapitating you. And as My the- kind of gal. Uh, yeah, I mean, what a way to go. I mean, who wants to trip into an IV the last six months of their lives when you could go this way? Right. And as the movie begins, there's a beautiful Shanghai detective uh, on her case, trying to find her. And she's always just a little bit too late. And then you find out that these victims are part of her, uh, the largest criminal organization in Shanghai. She's killing bad guys. Uh, and the question is, why? Who is she? And you'll find out at the end of the book. Uh, but uh, the detective, Detective Bing Bing, who's just as ravishing but a little bit more rough around the edges, is uh, uh, has an opportunity to catch her early on. It slips through her fingers. She's um, demoted. She's uh, accused of attempted murder. And the commissioner says they're going to prosecute you for attempted murder unless you come to work for my security detail. And, of course, the only reason this big fat commissioner wants Detective Bing Bing is because he wants a lot of sex from her. Of and course. And so she's used and abused and slapped and pummeled. And she has to take it or the commissioner is going to allow her to be prosecuted. Well, meanwhile, now the serial killer lady, Sin Sin Jen, Sin, is really going to town, killing people. And uh, one day when the commissioner has her strung up and he's letting her, his wife just pummel uh, the beautiful Detective Bing Bing, Sin sneaks in and beheads everybody there. And uh, hence uh, the big mystery, is the police force involved with the criminal organization? Of course they are. And now Bing Bing's really trying to find Sin, wondering why she didn't kill her too. And, of course, the two will eventually meet. And and that's not even halfway through the book. So uh, a lot's going to happen. The killer is a very seductress young lady. And uh, I learned a lot about the Chinese culture and wardrobe and and streets of Shanghai researching the book. I I think it'll be uh, a hit, hopefully in Asia, because they have a whole lot more people in Asia than they do here. Yeah, they've got uh, exponentially more um, and and much smaller landmass. Um, yeah. You know, I spent a lot of time in Southeast Asia uh, during my time in the Navy. I think Rick has been uh, all over Europe. Maybe not all over, but uh, I mean, I've been to I've been to Italy, I've been to Canada, I've been to Belize. So okay. I've been to, been to some some awesome places. Me? Okay, good. I, that that's what inspires me going to these places. How's Bragging Camp going? <laughs> <laughs> I, I went to Vietnam once, and I was telling a, a friend of mine, uh, you know, I was in Vietnam, and I did this, this, and this. And there are people at the other table came over and wanted to thank me for my service. And I was like, no, I, I wasn't there for the war. I, I was there teaching people, but I, maybe I look a lot older than I am. But I can say I've been in Nam. <laughs> I didn't lose. It's the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> <laughs> but are we going to read it, James? I think we are. Yeah. You yeah. know, James, don't read. James, you've read triple the books in your life that I have. <laughs> triple, if not quadruple. I yeah. might have to pick it up. I seen that name sounds familiar. I don't know where I saw it at, but I saw that that was coming out. So I don't know where I seen it. I think I shared something with you. It might have been one of the something links that I sent you. Shanghai Sin or something. Shanghai I seen it. Sin. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhere. It's, well, uh, without, without further ceremony. Uh, yeah. Let's let's go ahead and get into Madman. Rick, give yeah. us your rundown. All right. 
<clears throat> Let's do it. So I picked Madman, uh, honestly, because it's one of my favorite underrated, um, less well-known uh, slasher films ever. Um, it's uh, it's it's pretty pretty awesome, pretty low budget, but a pretty good film. Rick, um, I'm going to let you recenter your mind right now because we all just witnessed your cat walk across your laptop, and that's when you started stuttering and sweating. Yeah. And slobbering. Yeah, we saw the back end. Yeah, we saw the back end. Man, <laughs> feel good that you saw the front end. <laughs> All right? All right. Back at it. Anyway, so, yeah, Joe's Madman, uh, one of my favorite underrated slasher films, um, came out January 15th, 1982. Uh, it was, oddly enough, released in Wilmington, Delaware. Don't know why they chose Wilmington, but, hey, um, it's 88 minutes. It's made in the United States. Uh, its budget was 350000 It grossed $1.3 million. A um, couple really interesting facts about it, and then I'll get to a couple of the actors and actresses. Um, originally, they wanted Vincent Price to play the uh, main counselor. I think it was Mark or Max. No, Max. His name? Max, yeah. And they were going to approach him, but it was a non-union picture, so they were afraid that he wasn't going to do it. So they actually didn't approach him for that. Um, it was originally going to be called um, Madman the Legend Lives. It was based off the Cropsey a legend in upstate New York. Um, but like Christopher said, the the burning came out in 81. They said, scrap that. We're just going to make it Madman. Um, so to the actors, they don't really have a lot on them. Uh, and maybe Christopher knows more than I do. I can only really Please. find a couple things on um, Galen Ross, who was Betsy. Mm-hmm. She was yep. uh, Francine Parker in Dawn of the Dead. But honestly, I couldn't find a lot of any of their characters. It was hard. No, D- Galen Ross, you're right. Uh, the characters are a bit of a mystery. That's not a big name cast. Uh, even Galen Ross, I think only made four movies. Uh, she very quickly segued from acting to filming humanitarian documentaries in the third world. Um, and um, I believe, um, I be- and I forget what it is. I think Snyder did a tip of the hat to her in the new Dawn of the Dead movie. I think he called one of the stores in the malls Galen's or something. Uh, but yeah, her acting career, not on her own volition, uh, did not um, proceed much further than Mad Men. I know she's got a high batting average, though. Um, we're talking about Mad Men, Dawn of the Dead, and Creep yeah. Show are, are her yeah. three films. I tell you yeah, what, that's... she was buried to her head in Sand and Creep Show, wasn't she? I think so. Um, yeah. The, the thing and is, came that, back, you know. yeah, yeah. So. Um, if you really look at that, that's a lot of quality over quantity with Galen right. Ross. But I mean, I, I guess if you're going to go out, go out with uh, you know that thousand batting average. I, well, sort of like the uh, Grace Kelly of horror movies. I think Grace Kelly only had did eleven movies, um, but goes down in the movie fan hall of fame. And uh, you're right, and she obviously was liked by Romero because she did two of her movies were Romero movies. So. Yeah, and, and you know who who can forget uh, her flying off in the helicopter at the end of the Dawn of the Dead, knowing she's probably going to be eaten within a few hours. Yeah, <laughs> sad. <laughs> Hell of an ending. Yeah. Well, what else you got, Rick? Um, Paul Ellers was the axe wielding madman, Madman Mars. Um, he initially did some. Um, I think it was like production work on the film and they approached him and he actually knows martial arts. So he yeah. was approached because he was well versed in that to play the killer, uh, do some of the scenes. Um, Being 6'5 originally... didn't hurt. Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was originally filmed in uh, in New York, upstate New York. Um, and I mean, I just think it's a great cult film. I mean, the way that, you know, he tells the story at the beginning at the campfire and, you know, gets the kids scared. And yeah, it's pretty low budget. Uh, some of the film's kind of grainy in spots. The sound's kind of bad in some scenes. Um, but I mean, that's what, to me, that's what makes it a, a great underrated slasher film is it's not well known, but I think it's gained a cult following, you know, since then, I think. Well, you know, head counselor Max, um, since he's kind of the first you know, face and voice that you hear on this film, you kind of forgive that, you know, the, the, the low quality of the film because he does such an outstanding job, uh, you know, narrating his little scary story that you kind of forget that this, you know, was, you know, one of those movies that you pop a quarter in the machine, turn the little knob, and then it comes out in a little plastic thing. This is a, you know, a cheaply made movie, but, I mean, it's pretty fucking great because... Yeah. 
Yeah. Max kicks it off with a bang. There are a couple of really weird shot scenes in this movie, and I think they just did it to have a little fun. And if I'm not mistaken, it's been a while since I've seen it. There's a scene where they're in the hot tub and they're just sort of spinning around. They're, they're just, yeah, spinning around the <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's so weird. Yeah. And then another one, they're laying down head to head. <laughs> and, uh, um, I, you, you know, if Kubrick had made it, if Hitchcock had made it, that would have meant something uh, deep. Here you think, hey, let's just do it. I thought they were filming like an ABBA music video or something with these guys. <laughs> it looked, I mean, when, yeah, when they get up and they, they're they kind of leaning, posing in front of that fireplace, it really looked like uh, the SOS uh, music video. But, you know, many a scary story has been told by the embers of a campfire. But, like, yeah. rarely has it been done prior to giving any backstory on the characters right. of the film. Like, so how do we feel about this opening campfire scene? Aside from uh, the singing uh, Italian Stallion. Uh, a classic setup. It's, uh, you know, they're at camp. It's uh, a- a- immediate uh, references to Friday the 13th, which would have come out at that time. Um, these characters are a little bit more aggressive as far as uh, developing a relationship with the viewer. Uh, they won't be, they'll be similarly as successful at staying alive as they were on Friday the 13th. But uh, th- this one, um, uh, y- you know, has a more grisly story. Friday the 13th had a drowned boy. All right, happens. This one had a, a bit more horrific story to. Uh, catapult it into the next night or and Friday the, the 13th was just a year prior right well this is part two because yeah. the, the 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 campfire story that we're talking about was from part two with Paul yeah. and the the counselors right and I believe that was just a year prior so of course there was some sort of influence there um yeah. but you know like if if there was a girl who I wanted to you know, take the pound town sitting around that fire. I don't think I'd be putting on the display that TP is putting on with his little spooky song. No, no. <laughs> but uh, from experience, you've been around these cab fires and you've seen other guys just crash and burn doing really stupid things. So it's kind of realistic. Uh, yeah, I guess so. You want to sit back and let them crash and burn. So yeah. I guess there's less competition. I'm not saying we've been those guys, but the other no. people. No, I wouldn't dream of being that guy. I don't know. I might put on a performance of like Minnie the Moocher or something if the mood takes me there. Pat Calloway, yeah. Yeah. Chicks dig it. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, they say they do. I don't think they really do. But uh, mm-hmm. I found it really cool how they incorporated um, a small flash forward into the future uh, of yeah. some of these campers and counselors as uh, like TP would um, interact with them during a song. It didn't give everything away, but it does yeah. give like a small taste of what's to come. Yeah. Yeah, but you know we don't have to wait very long for things to pa- to, to, to pick up in Madman. Like in a lot of films, namely Friday the Thirteenth yeah. or Sleepaway right. Camp, uh, both of which you know we reviewed here on Slashers and Screamers, we get a flashback followed by somewhat yeah. of a narrative exposition, followed by meeting the characters. Uh, there'll right. be a few scenes where you know through some sophomoric hijinks, who you know the comic relief, or who's the womanizer, who's the flirt, who's the bookworm. In Madman, yeah. we just get a group of strangers you know people strange yeah. to us um yeah. and, and an urban legend tale where someone just yeah. you know screws up at the end and does the thing they weren't supposed to do in this yeah. case it's you know saying the killer's name above a whisper so right. w- where does madman mars rank on the list of all-time great urban legends i guess um we'll start with our esteemed guest christopher yeah i i think um uh, as a reminder to the 80s that uh it is out of the realm of the mainstream 80s slashers but uh sort of the hidden treasure um, he is uh, vicious, he's grotesque, uh, and he's very complete. He leaves no stone unturned. And, and like I said, as far as spoilers go, there are going to be no witnesses. And, and in fiction, the bad guys typically leave a witness, which is the downfall. Uh, there are going to be no witnesses here. And uh, although there's a morality to it, too, uh, there's a lot of premarital sex going on. And when you do that, you have no guarantee of living to see the next day in these movies and a lot of times in real life as well. But uh, uh, now, if I'm not mistaken, I might be these camp counselors are on their final days of camp. They're waiting for the kids to be picked up. Mm -hmm. Uh, The kids aren't the the little kids, uh, not the teenagers. I don't think they're touched at all. I don't believe they're beset by the killer no i is you know spoiler alert but i think somewhere near the end um betsy 
uh, puts yeah. him on a bus and tells the old the oldest one to just you know drive like hell. Yeah, yeah. And a couple of the kids come out of the cabin to see what's going on. As he tells them to get back inside, but that's pretty much the gist of it. I, I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah they, they, they the pretty much kept the kids safe. Is Michael Myers in uh, Halloween Two? Uh, that's the one where Pamela Susan Shoop gets her head burned off in the hot tub. Uh, but he goes through the maternity ward, and he has no interest in harming any of the babies. Even these uh, these uh, epitomes of evil seem to have some sort of morality that doesn't cross the line. Well, you know, I, I can tell you right now, um, R- Rick and Casey wouldn't care if he did. He, he could decapitate all. He could decapitate all those kids, but the moment he har- harms a dog, oh, oh. Well, you, you guys remember the bookends uh, with uh, Rebecca Balding and, um, what was her name, Susan Martin, uh, the, the dame that married Michael Crichton. And uh, uh, she had a little dog, a little white poodle, and the bookends get the little white poodle and uh, suck it down the air vent. And, uh, you, you know, it's like they killed the dog. And that was 1981. Nowadays, they kill the dog all the time. I mean, the dog used to be the dog runs in the woods, owner goes after it, the owner is shredded, and an hour later the dog comes out of the woods. But now they kill the dogs all the time. It's like uh, the Asian influence that they, they eat them over in Asia. It's kind of, you know, here we just, we've now opened them up to the slasher. Well, you know, we reviewed Funny Games. Yeah. Um, the American, well, I, I say the American is the same director, but, you know, the, the American version and... Um, there was a scene where the dog, I think it was a golden retriever, maybe. Um, memory's failing me. But um, yeah. Naomi, it, it was a, a golden retriever? Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, the um, they open the SUV, the dog falls out, and Rick, you know, we have to pause the podcast because Rick is crying. I was and not. Rick, I have witnesses that say you were crying. Real tears. And it's all right. Nobody blames you. Nobody blames uh, you. Know, yeah, Casey, yeah. you know, makes a good point. You know, um more people can relate to losing a dog than losing a kid. Right. And, right. um, yeah, I mean, that, that's fair. V- very fair. Right. Right. Well, Rick, where does Madman Mars rank amongst the urban legend? Uh, I guess we should narrow say... those down, though, shouldn't we? Candyman. Mm-hmm. Um, Bloody Mary. Well, Bloody Mary. Uh, I couldn't think of it. I mean, th- th- there are a few. I mean, uh, to me, yeah. Madman Mars might be my favorite because he is the, the pure slasher. What say you? Uh, yeah, I would say for, you know, for originality, uh, for not really having a, a backstory, we don't know why his face is dif- disfigured. We don't know why his hands are, you know, messed up. You know, we don't have that. We just know, okay, you don't say his name above a whisper or he's going to come out. And I think that's one cool thing about it for me is just the aspect of, okay, we don't really know his backstory. Just the guy that kills people. No real, no real reason, no supernatural force, you know, wasn't traumatized as a kid, just kills them. And I think it's, it's, I wouldn't rank it like top 10, but I think it's, it's pretty, pretty interesting, you know, for me. So can climb a tree like nobody's business. <laughs> right. Yeah. Casey, what say you? Look, we haven't had this experience on the podcast yet together. I didn't like this movie. <sighs> Here we go. It just wasn't for me. And I love a slasher. But honestly, and this is maybe my biggest complaint, is the music takes me so far out of it. Like, the music in this movie is so distracting to me. (laughs) It's loud, and it's all the time. And there's weird moments of singing, and there's a sex scene where someone is just singing super loudly, which, whatever, but... I just wasn't really able to get into this one. Well, you know, that that person knows their audience. Clearly. uh, Well, I mean, whatever, you know, gets them to O-Town, you know. If it's bad singing, so be it. I guess we're all different. But I'm surprised that you didn't like this one. That's (laughs) fine. I'm surprised I didn't like this one. It is not my... (laughs) JB, this just feels like it is right up your alley. Bill, this is the greatest movie ever made. (laughs) <laughs> I loved I mean, it in every single way. To hell with Scorsese. Yeah. To hell with Spielberg. Right. It's right. Madman. Right. Yeah. Madman. So Banana claw fingers. 
<laughs> well, you how know, you bad? Talk about, you, know, you talk about annoying musical scores. If you think about it, it's a terrific movie. Romero's Dawn of the Dead had a really obnoxious musical score by the Goblins, but it worked. And uh, Zombie, Lucio Fulci's movie, had that pounding, annoying score, but it worked. And uh, um, I don't know what, there's this whole science behind music and what it does to our brains and stuff and how it, uh, motivates us and how it uh, persuades us, uh, but I, I don't know a whole bunch about the science. But uh, uh, but music is very 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 important in these movies, and uh, uh, music and the sounds. Um, I mean, you, they, in some movies they become very iconic. Um, so the music in Friday the Thirteenth, Friday the Thirteenth Part Two yeah. stresses me the hell out. Yeah. In in, yeah. in the in the best possible way. Right. Um. And no, actually, I'm talking about the the chase scenes. Not the yeah. not the sound effects. There's a uh, this violin, like a very screechy violin, yeah. uh, especially prominent in the final scenes. But um, mm-hmm. I'm not going to keep bringing it Friday the Thirteenth because James will vomit. Um, but when it comes to music, you know, and, and movies, I mean, the old saying is, "It has vi- happened before; <laughs> it will happen again." No doubt. But video killed the radio star, right? You put. Music, yeah. music's great. Video is great. When you put it together, it can be a big old mess or it can be the greatest thing you ever saw. Yeah. And uh, I do have a theory, though, on why Casey did not like this film. I'm going to hold on to that theory oh. because I want to hear more. Um, well, fuck it. It's because there's no final girl. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> we talked about that. It's because yeah. there's no final girl. I mean... There were, there were candidates for them because you knew it, it would have to be a clean cut count. <coughs> And there were a couple of them. Who were Every time candidates. you thought someone was going to be like a final girl, she'd up and die. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, it's like they kept setting you up for that expectation. And then you watch her and it's like, oh, well, there goes her head. Right. <laughs> there goes her virginity. There goes her head. You, you guys remember uh, the burning um, where Lee Ayers, I forget the character's name, is the sweetest, most angelic camp counselor there is. And, and she survives the movie. But there's doubt because about three quarters of the way through the movie, she has premarital sex with somebody. And I remember thinking, oh, no, now she's going to die. Right. Yep. I know. That's a rule. She did and didn't die. So it's sort of the reverse happened there. Um, and then she went on to become some sort of uh, child education instructor in Baltimore and uh, didn't stay in acting much after that as well. So did she really survive, Chris? I think not. You know something? You could say no. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. But yeah, guys, uh, how badass is Frederick Newman, a.k.a. Carl Fredericks, in the role of Max, especially in this campfire scene, in the opening, the, the cold open, I guess. This guy can narrate yeah. my, my my eulogy, I mean, and it, I would raise up and thank it, him. It, it, yeah. Right. I mean, it really reminded me of the movie that was before, t- before this, but similar, is The Falk, when he's telling the story at the beginning, you know, the ghost story, one, you know, you know, and it's like it had that to me. It had that same type of atmosphere. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah, I can dig that. Chris, tell me, are any of your books on audio? No, none of them are on audio. Uh, I, uh, I ask for a very specific we... reason. Yeah. First of all, for me to really be immersed into a story, I need good narration. If I'm listening to it, um, I right. think you do well uh, narrating your uh, your own books. Uh, you, you should uh, you know think about that. But um, I will. Well, you know, I'm flattered. Oh, well, you know, uh, Max, I don't know what name he's going by here. There, there's a few actors in this movie who changed their names later in their in their careers. Um, Frederick Newman, I don't know if he was Carl Fredericks. I think he might have been Carl Fredericks in this role and Frederick Newman later on. But, I mean, I, I probably saw this film when I was around nine years old, uh, nine or ten, but not one time since. And I specifically remembered him telling this story way back uh, 30 years ago. When I saw it for the first time, that's how, you know, that's how long it stays with you. A good narrator will kick your ass listening to uh, a good book. Uh, I I think of Hector Elizondo uh, narrating uh, The Pearl, which is one of my favorite books. But who is just seeing this movie for the first time? Casey, you, this this is your first time, right? Yep. JB, yours? I've never seen this movie before in my life. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, I guess you weren't at my house that day when, when I watched. Well, okay, so it's good Although that you know I we remember, have some who... <clears throat> I remember something about his claws, but that was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. You're pretty fixated on those claws, James. That's all he's got, Bill. you got to work with your strong points. 
<laughs> That's a fact. Well, you know, of course, because we can't have nice things like quiet camps in the woods near dilapidated old homes where crazed killers used to live, we have one joker. A man who likes to measure life by the sweat under his armpits and the urine stains on his pants. A kid like Richie, played by Jimmy Steele, a.k.a. Tom Candela. Again, uh, another one of those pseudonyms. Who wants to challenge the legitimacy of of the urban legend and yell the name Madman Mars at the top of his lung. Um, who else expected Richie to be the first one to die? I know. Yeah. Having not seen it in so long, I couldn't remember the order of, of deaths. I expected Richie to be the first one to go. So Frederick Newman, uh, Carl Fredericks, Jimmy Steele, Tom Candela. Why are so many people in this film changing their names? And why are they ashamed of working on this film? You know, I, I don't know. You know, Jason Alexander didn't change his name after the burning. Um, it, I don't know. Great. Galen Ross even has a different name in this 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 one. Really? And uh, yeah. What's her name in this movie? Uh, not the character's name. What's the actress's name? Uh, that is Galen Ross. Um, Alexis Steuben. Yeah, stupid. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why. I mean, Galen Ross sure would with the higher crowd would have had name name recognition. I did not pick that up. Um, yeah. That's crazy. When I first saw this movie, yeah, I saw the cast, and this was in the 80s, and then I said, that's Galen Ross. And you you didn't have the internet back then. And it was a mystery for years. And then you had the internet, and you looked it up, and it says, Alexis Steuben, and then Adam Duby has a parenthesis as, uh, no, Galen Ross, and parenthesis as Alexis Steuben. And uh, I don't know why. Um, Who knows? Um, uh, Maybe she didn't like the hot tub scene where they're spinning around. Oh, yeah, um, I would have changed my name and left the country. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, um, yeah. So, but, yeah, I don't know why. Well, uh, I, I don't either, but uh, Richie, uh, he's playing down the legend of Mad Mad Mars. Uh, he throws a rock seemingly for miles because from the campfire, we can't see the house. And from the house, we can't see the campfire. So not only does Richie have an arm like Jackie Bradley Jr., he's also got his accuracy. Because the rock goes right through the window of Mars's home. Um, am I crazy to think Mars is going to let him go until that rock came through his kitchen window? Uh, I don't... What, what, was he going to was he going to listen to Max and say, "Well, he do, he doesn't know any better." Probably not. Jackie Bradley Jr. Uh, played baseball at South Carolina, the Boston Red Sox, and now the Brewers. I just want you to go, you guys know I'm uh, first in much more than just horror movies, but no, <laughs> he, he's he's going to be a goner. Uh, he, I, I guess he's not first, uh, which is another I don't know say a rule that's broken by this movie, but uh, uh, I, I think this shows the guys who made this movie were not math whizzes. Uh, probabilities don't seem to apply. Uh, statistics don't seem to apply. Uh, order doesn't seem to apply. Calculus doesn't seem to apply. Uh, it was probably made by people just like us. I mean, it, it it was made during the the winter, and it was supposed to be fall, and they had to paint the leaves yellow and orange. So. Which also so t- happened in uh, Sleepaway Camp, right? We had talked about yep. how they were painting them green for summertime. That was another summertime. movie we watched, not this movie. <laughs> <laughs> they painted leaves in this movie too. They yeah. painted leaves in this movie too, James. Good and it's God. and it's not it's and it's really not even the same group of dumbasses. That wasn't made on two dollars and fifty cents. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as crazy as that sounds, the Cleveland Browns at Old Municipal Stadium used to paint the dirt green, and um, you know, so. Uh, I mean, good for them. I don't, you know, it's uh, James. Didn't you uh, just say you got to work with what you got? Yeah. Yeah, somebody. I'm said. very contradictory tonight. Yep, <laughs> I might say one thing but think another. Just James, tonight. You, only you've tonight. been only tonight, Casey. You said like it. when I said I like this movie, I like lied. That. Oh. <laughs> Well, you know, maybe I missed something, or maybe I've just seen it too much in my 29 years of life on this earth. But, uh, yeah, you heard me. Yeah. Why is why is TP catching hell for something Max did by scaring the kids with the story? That was I've all got a Max. Question. Oh God! Why does that picture behind me, behind you, make me think of oatmeal cream pies? <laughs> what? I think it's that little. I think it's that girl's head. Reminds me of. Oh, well, that's a guy. Good lord. <laughs> so is that girl in the movie? Uh, I, I don't uh, think that guy or that girl is in the movie because that. Well, I guess that's supposed to be um, TP and Betsy, right? Yeah, Maybe just not, poorly drawn. It is, 
Yeah. Well, you know, that that's that's just like the old comic books where the cover was never really inside the comic book. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, if you look at the cover of uh, The Warriors, none of the people are on, you know, yeah. on the, the, the front, you know, port of the, the Warriors are in that movie. Yeah. Um, you know, except the Baseball Furies, who you really can't, you know, can't pick those guys out of a lineup. They were those, yeah, Yankee kids, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, I mean, everyone at the camp sees TP and Betsy having their spat. And uh, Stacy breaks them up, and that brings me to my question. Yeah. Who, and Christopher, this is something that might require a little explanation, but who gets the Slashers and Screamers Hammer Award for this movie? Oh, I'm God. heavily, I'm yeah. heavily leaning towards Stacy, played by it's Harriet Stacey. Bass. It yeah. is Stacy, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Now, I love it, her hair. Yeah. Uh, very attractive young lady. Wait uh, a minute. You know what, you know what I'm talking about when I say the Hammer Award? No. Yeah. Well, because you're nailing it right on the head, man. The Hammer Award goes to, by God, the hammer of this movie. And that would be the most attractive person, um, oh. i.e. i.e. Bruce Campbell in uh, Evil Dead 2. That okay. handsome son of a bitch with that yeah. jawline. And then yeah. uh, Friday the 13th, we had a little debate, okay? Old Casey okay. over here in her lion eyes said yeah. that it was Kevin Bacon. I it said it Kevin was Robbie Bacon. Morgan, uh, who doesn't last very long. You know, this is all very scientific. I've made the points over and over in my review that a lot of rules and laws, and there's the rule of there can only be one babe, uh -huh. uh, which means if you're the second uh, most attractive babe, you're gone. Silver medal. Uh, there can, Nobody there remembers can only you. be one. And, uh, and that one who gets it most viciously is often the sixth person in the credits. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't know if that's the case here, but usually the sixth one in the credits, pretty gory. Yeah, oh. yeah. Well, I mean, in I well, want to keep I guess an eye on that for the future. <laughs> Well, we're going to have to hold on to that one for this one because it, it, it might hold up. Um, we're going to have to yeah. talk about it a little bit later, but, uh, but I, I guess moving forward. has got a mind like a steel trap, Bill. Like a steel trap. I mean, you takes one to know one, doesn't it, James? <laughs> it's about time you got a guest that I appreciate. Right. <laughs> well, wait a minute. What was wrong with James Alexander last week? There's not enough room for two Jameses, is there? There's not enough room for two Jameses in this podcast. Well, two babes or two Jameses, yeah. I, I, I guess, uh, yeah, two babes and two Jameses. Good call, Chris. <laughs> well, you know, if Richie wasn't at fault for luring Madman Mars out to the woods that night, he was surely at fault for not saying a goddamn word during the spooky scene with Mars looking down on everyone from the trees. A clear human silhouette seen in the trees, both standing still and moving. He, he can be seen climbing down the trees. We've yet to get a good look at Mars, okay? We, we know he's brutal. He feels nothing for his victims, but we've got no visuals. So the silhouette in the trees, immobile for the first few seconds, so we don't know if it's a cluster of limbs or a madman of the trees. Is this few seconds of the film the spookiest shot in all 90 minutes? Nope. To me, the silhouette seeing him in the trees gave me a chill. Re gave me a chill. I, I go back to the heads turning in the hot tub. I don't know why that freaks me out. It's like the keyboard <laughs> elves just weird things to me. I, I, I that, that stuff affects me. I don't you've know why. Got, you've got a great point. <laughs> oh God, James. What's rule number one to survive in a slasher film? Rule number one. Rule number two is don't have don't sex. Go to the bathroom by yourself. It's close, Casey. What's rule number one? The first rule is you don't survive if you have sex, which is what they say in Scream, anyway. Well, Scream doesn't know. Rule number two is the no sex. What, Rick? What is rule number one? Uh, don't go swimming. Topher, what's rule number one? D don't don't split up. Don't split up. It's yeah. don't stray yeah. away from the group. What does Richie do? Bill, he's, he's why up, is my answer not correct? Because not going to the bathroom alone is not splitting up. Well, that's one he person. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm talking about one person. They, they split up the whole group in this movie. Remember Cabin in the Woods? They played on that. Uh, the only guy not affected when they say, let's split up, says, are you kidding me? <laughs> well, let's split up. And, uh, but, it's because uh, yeah, he knew. Yeah, well, what does Richie up. do from the beginning? Like, he, he, he splits up. Well, he's, he's jogging in place behind everybody doing their weird, you know, rank mar marching in ranks. And he goes off to look for the guy that he clearly sees as, you know, 20 feet in front of him. And he goes off on this long journey to find him and never does. Well, kind of does. But does he survive? Spoiler alert. Yes, he does. He broke rule number one and survived. And another spoiler. 
I mean, we've already talked about it. The film doesn't subscribe to the final girl thing. They broke the rules and still gave us a classic. So where are we? Well, what do we think of the film not staying with the final girl? Uh, You know, you look at it at the time it was made and you look at it 40 years later and you like it 40 years later at the time it sort of ticked you off. Uh, The nerds that we were when we went to see this movie in 1981 uh, we didn't have girlfriends. We didn't even talk to girls. I was scared to death of them. And these were our girlfriends. I never uh, saw a girl till 10th grade. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Who are they? What is it? And, uh, uh, and so these were our girlfriends. These were, they didn't talk back to you. They didn't look at you like you were stupid. Uh, they were smart. They didn't like the jock boyfriends. Uh, and we imagined that they'd like us, uh, call it insanity or whatever. And so when they get killed here, when Galen Ross gets killed, when uh, Miss Bass gets killed, uh, we're left without a date for the prom. And uh, but forty years later, you look at it's different and it's original and it's kind of refreshing because even forty years later, for the most part, they still follow those themes, and so it is a little different. It sets itself apart from the uh, the heavy hitting classics, the Halloween's, the Friday the Thirteenth, the unknowingly, the yeah. I, uh, I wonder the if they knew at the so, time. Yeah. Well, I, at the time, you know, it was still uh, a new genre. You know, a new genre coming out so quickly. It was, uh, it was uh, Italian Jallo would kill off the girls a lot, or the girls would be the psycho killers. Uh, and this had that brutality, but it left the purity of the fairer sex respected, and that they would indeed survive. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and Mad uh, and Madman. They don't, which is sort of a tip of the head to the 1972, 1973, 1974 Jallo Italian movie where the babe was going to get sliced with a razor. Well, our uh, director very, is Italian, yeah? He, uh, what's, what's the director's name? Maybe, yeah, maybe, yeah that's, that's a good point. Uh, uh, he could be. Joe G- Giannone. Yeah. And perfect name. Joey Buttafuoco. Argento, uh, Giannone, you know, uh, uh, and... And he could be he, from Wisconsin. I don't know, but could be. I don't know. I don't know. Well, in the uh, first twenty minutes of this film, a we've lot met, of we've at least in Wisconsin, Bill. There's a ton cheese, of cheese, yeah. James. A lot of but cheese. But in the first twenty minutes, we've at least met everyone, even if we don't know a great deal about them. Betsy and Stacy are bonding over how shitty they both, they both think TP is. <laughs> shitty TP. Uh, yeah. TP and Max are bonding o- on their own, attempting to pull an axe out of a stump. So you know things are going great. Um, yeah. Well, do they ever say how that axe got stuck in the stump? Was it Mars that did that? Did they ever even hint at it? I don't think they Mad said. Mad Mars is a wood chopping fool. He is a wood chopping fool. But did he put that axe, his axe stuck in that stump? Yeah. Well, no mere mortals got the strength to pull that axe out. But before we get into the exploits of Madman Mars, James, you got our villain rundown? Probably not. He's lean. He's mean. He's ready to kill somebody. Yeah. And he's got a and he's got a can of Tic Tacs. He's ten foot tall and bulletproof. And James, he's got claws sharp as razors and an axe just as sharp. He's Madman Mark. <laughs> <laughs> now I think that's your next door neighbor, uh, Madman Mark. I ain't got no neighbors, Bill. <laughs> well, not anymore. If I did have one, his name wouldn't be Madman Mark. Well, you know. Legend says that Madman Mars is out there stalking the night, looking for his next victim to decapitate, but not everybody meets that fate, right? Um, Why is he so mad? What's he so mad about, Bill? We don't know. We never get a backstory. We don't get the lore. What are you doing? Chewing aluminum foil, James? (laughs) He just killed his whole family one time. And decided to, as somebody whispered his name, he would he'd come after them. That's I mean, a pretty petty thing though? to be pissed off about. Bill, that could happen to you. I might it's just get mad petty. one day and come over there. That's yeah. why I call you by nicknames, James. I never, uh, uh, yeah, just in case. You don't know. This could be a, a great Avenger of goodness. You didn't know who his family was. Uh, yeah, they might have been scoundrels. Yeah, now I know some of you at least uh, watch the neighbors from across the street with their mom and dad and kids, and, and, and the, the kids are three legged dog. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and you're thinking if a psycho killer came by and killed them all, I'd pretend to be sad, but 
<laughs> well, I'm not saying I would, but some people. No, might you're, this is purely hypothetical. Yeah. Purely hypothetical. But you know, the first guy, his name is yeah. Dippy, which is you know, yeah, it is what yeah. it is. Yeah, he gets probably the most superficial death, but it was quick and unexpected. Most notably, weaponless. Um, yeah. Get, gets it with the claws. How do we rate this kill? I'm giving it a cool two slashes out of five. Two slashes. Casey, what say you? I'll give it two. Two's good, it's not right? My favorite in the movie, but it's not flashy, know. but it lets you know he's there. JB, how many slashes? I give it one claw up. One claw up. Okay, Ricky. Uh, I'll probably say two. Okay, you fucking copycat. <laughs> Be original, two Rick. What, Rick. Two and a half. Two and a half. Two and a half what? Two and a half what? Flashes. Okay. Christopher, the way we do I'll this is... Three. I'll give it three. three. Give it three? Okay, well, it, it's, 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 it's on par. You I know? appreciate the sentiment. <laughs> when a dippy is slashed, it, it's automatic, too. We barely know him. Dippy. Well, we, we barely know Dippy, but because his name is Dippy, I think you can confer a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and you can probably infer that he was kind of a dumbass anyway, and he won't be missed. Probably not. You know, uh, his parents will miss him for a while. They'll get an exchange student from Sweden next year, Inga, and uh, they'll go from there. They'll be happy again. <laughs> well, if you thought you were going to get out of this film without seeing some Italian man ass, you were yeah. sorely mistaken, because not only did we get Italian man-ass, we got one of the most awkward displays of non-touching foreplay I've ever seen in my 29 years. Yeah. What the hell were those little twirls they were doing? Didn't like it. Yeah, weird. Mm, no. Like, y- you know, it begs the question, have any of us tried it? <laughs> you know, fair. I, I, I'm not saying I, we need to answer that question. I did not but, come prepared to answer that question. Yeah. Yeah, it's not something you look at and say, I got to do that. Um, Of course, they could come back and say, oh, you got to do that. Uh, But I I see no merit in it. And if anybody's watching you do it, your reputation's pretty done. Uh, There's probably a lot other better ways to do it. Yeah, draw the curtains. Um, The movie Stripes had the best let's not touch each other foreplay scene. Of course, they eventually end up failing and touching each other. But of course, uh, of course. Yeah. Um, but that's because they didn't twirl in the in, in the water yeah. for no reason. For like they, five they could say a virtual condom was placed over them. Absolutely. Like you remember the, the naked gun? Yeah. 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 <laughs> you remember the naked gun with his body condoms? Basically, yeah. this is what that was without the body condom. Like a force field or Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I, I wanna yeah. Mm, no. Well, Neil's to say they broke rule number two, no sex. So right. without and formally saying goodbye. <sighs> Uh, of course you have, James. We can say goodbye to TP and Betsy without saying goodbye. But Mars is everywhere. You know, one minute he's skulking around the hot tub watching TP and Betsy going to, uh, you know, aquatic pound town. Then he's yeah. behind Stacy as he's struggling to climb a hill. James, yeah. does uh, does your tail of the tape there say anything about superhuman speed? He has uh, superhuman speed and agility. Does it really say that? Yeah. He's agile, Bill. Oh, he's, yeah, hostile, agile, and mobile. quick feet, you can't be a serial killer. You know what? Quick feet and violent hands. Oh, yeah. So that's a good defensive lineman. Michael Myers is right there. Slow as hell. Well, is he slow or is he efficient? Both. Yeah, but we don't see him him off camera. We we, we don't see what he's doing. Like, it might be like Ed Rooney on uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Remember that scene where he's walking by the classrooms and he takes off running between the doors? When he gets in front of the doors, he stands up and starts walking straight. I think that's what Michael Myers is doing. He's the Ed Rooney of serial killers. If they film that, that'd look He's got good footwork, (laughs) Bill. He's got that, yeah. He's got good footwork. Portals on Earth where they don't have to run, but they can go just two or three feet and all of a sudden be two or three miles away. Yeah, yeah. So, like, the the, the only way they were to, I guess, make up for that in the uh, the Friday the 13th video game, they gave Jason um, this teleport power. Yeah. And that kind of, like, well, it's never been said that he can teleport, but how else can you do it? You know, they didn't even give him that in Jason X. Um, uh, if there's ever a time to give him teleportation, right. it's Jason in X. Space, yeah, they, they could have done it then, and they didn't. Uh, in fact, he sort of body surfed down to back down to Camp Crystal Lake uh, through the atmosphere using 
that guy has a heat shield, uh, it's probably a uh, metaphor for the disaster shuttle program and, and all the blowing up it would do. I don't know. Chris, I'm, the only thing that we will ever disagree on tonight is whether anything in Friday the 13th is metaphorical. I, <laughs> I don't think they ever thought anything through except for what we're seeing. Well, I mean, God bless you know, Steve Miner and, you know, Cunning yeah. Man. I don't know. They, I think they just said, hey, we need another movie. Yeah. The first one was great. We yeah. already killed them all. Friday the 13th podcast or just slashers and screamers. I think when Christy Angus gets her head put down in the liquid nitrogen and Jason X, it was a direct metaphor for the failing healthcare system in this country. That was no doubt. <laughs> I'm sure that's what the director had in mind when he. Uh, Why the hell not? Her face. And what a beautiful face it was. Uh, Why the hell not? Well, you know. Didn't uh, Freddie kill Jason? He did not. He beheaded him, or vice versa. Vice versa. Vice versa. Like he's dead to me, Bill. Yeah, but still looking around even after he's beheaded. Well, moving on, we 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 find our crew in the cabin cutting the uh, the ABBA music video, which was wonderful. Uh, You know, the 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 synchronous posing in front of the fireplace, and there's the laying you know ear to ear on the rug. I mean, these guys were definitely stand-ins for the SOS music video. But yes. speaking of SOS, TP wished he could yell for help when he was hanging from that tree. Okay, this is my oh, favorite yeah. kill in the movie, by the yeah, way. Same. I legit thought he was going to escape. Yeah. They do a good job in this movie of teasing escapes. You think people yeah. are going to get away from this guy. And like the way you could see that he was a little too close to the branch that was above him. Um, you think that maybe the director made it that way for him to escape. You know, he was fighting to pull himself up. It looked like he was going to succeed. But, of course, Madman shows up somehow from many, many feet below, reaches up, grabs TP by the front of his belt, pulls him down, snapping his neck with a noose. And what made this so visually awesome was that the actor, uh, Tony Nunziata, would actually choke himself um, but uh, during this scene. Like, the, the idea was to, to make it look realistic. So that, his, his discolored, not discolored, um, you know, the, the purple face was legit. Uh, the, the director worried at times that, uh, you know, he, that he would make himself pass out during the, the takes. So when you see that purple face and the veins in his forehead, that's legit. That, that's not makeup. And uh, I think I will never be as dedicated to any job as Tony Nunziata was to that hanging scene. Wow. Bananas. That's my favorite shot of the whole movie, though, because I don't feel like you usually see when someone's hanging that their face is actually discolored like it would be. Oh, no. Like, it's I feel like, like any it was of done ours. really well. It was yeah. done great. I, I don't know who worked on makeup on this one. I, I feel like it was somebody in the, the acting cast. Maybe Dippy, because Dippy was, um, he worked on a lot of things as a visual, uh, something. Maybe There's a Game lot of, of movies. You think? I don't know. I, uh, um, we're assuming it was a woman. Um, it might have been, gals, do it yourselves. You know, <laughs> you know? yeah, go yeah. go home, come to work in your makeup, and, yeah. and, yeah. and let it go. Well, it, it, it was a non-union picture anyway, so I mean, yeah. Uh, good call, good call. But you know, TP and Betsy are clearly uh, the Jim and Pam of this film. Okay, it, it, from The Office because they are secretly toxic, toxic as hell. But Bill and Ellie are the true babyface couple here. I was rooting for them to make it. They're not gonna make it. Yeah. I really like the two of them. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, the uh, director. Uh, they weren't gonna make it, and uh, you didn't know that comparing it to other slasher films, as you saw it. But looking back, now it all makes sense. Yeah, it, nobody was going to make this. But, you know, the brutality we saw with TP and Dippy was just kind of the beginning. Because remember when TP and Max couldn't budge that axe in the tree stump? Well, Mars comes and snatches that thing out of there with minimal effort and probably with his non-dominant hand. Well, hell, he's probably ambidextrous. I don't know. But who gets it worse? Uh, you know, you've got this whole uh, you know crew of people who, uh, you know, Let's go back to you know, rule number one. Don't split up. The crew's pretty much all split up, though, right? And, you know, they pay the price for it. But Mars takes them out one by one. But my yeah. question to you all is who gets it worse? Dave with the uh, axe beheading? Stacy with the truck hood for a guillotine? Stacy with the truck hood for me, dude. Right? Yeah. Pretty yeah. close. I've got one more, 
And, you know, of course, there's Bill who, you know, gets dragged from the truck. And I don't really know what happens to him other than, like, you know, getting the back of his neck squeezed really hard. But Ellie, who might be the best actress in this whole damn film, she meets her gruesome man when she catches an axe to the chest, like, right on the numbers. Like, Joe Montana couldn't have hit her any better. Right. But wait, that's not all Ellie gets. She miraculously survives that encounter, and as Betsy's checking things out, Ellie appears in a window before Betsy absolutely obliterates her with a shotgun. So does anybody really get it worse than Ellie? No. no. Yeah, because <laughs> technically Ellie wasn't killed by Mark. True. That, that is true. Man, Betsy. And, and did you see the speed in which Betsy completely forgot about the fact that she just shot uh, Ellie in the face? Like yeah. She goes back to just, hey, kids. Let's leave. So yeah. they'll never moved know. I'm gone so fast. So yeah. fast. Thank you. I, I was. I'm glad I'm not the only one to notice that. But she moved on faster than any ex girlfriend I ever had. Yeah. Yeah. Tell you laughing at. <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about Bill for a second. You know, Ellie, his girl. You know, he's got her. She's got him. You know, she comes screaming that she saw a giant man who was hideous, and he's like, well, let's go look and see uh, what, what it was, if, if there was anything at all. Like, okay, dumb. But when they get there and there's nothing there, Ellie just accepts it and smiles like, okay, thank goodness that what I clearly saw was just my imagination. I couldn't get past that. Could not get past how quickly she just accepted that, no, I, I didn't see anything. Okay, let's just leave then. He is, there's clearly a burly man that looks kind of like the godfather of Joel James, and she just ignores it after they go there and he's not there five seconds later. Did it piss anybody else off? It pissed me off. I don't think I thought that deeply about that. Sometimes, Bill, you just might think you saw something. Like you were Bigfoot. Mm. Is that fair? Throwing out big guns. Yeah. Bill? Hmm? I really saw Bigfoot. It was not, and I did not forget about it either, Bill. Well, okay, that's fair. You didn't forget. How could you? No. Like I said, I saw Bigfoot, Bill, and he asked me again about seeing Bigfoot, and I go, Oh, what are you talking about? (laughs) No, I have warned you every podcast that Bigfoots are real, and they are coming to get you. Would they not be big feet? The guy who wrote uh, the zombie survival guy in World War Z, did you read his book, uh, Max Brooks, The Evolution? Did not, but please do oh. tell. No. Oh, okay, this is it. This is at the, the middle of the woods, just like just like this movie. All these uh, liberal environmentalists build a, a commune where they have totally 100% biodegradable everything, no carbon footprint at all. They build these houses in Washington State in the woods, and uh, Mount Rainier explodes, and all of Seattle and western Washington are just gone. Um, the roads are gone. Now, they're fine, because everything east of Seattle is gone, and the uh, roads are closed. All the rescue efforts are centered on Seattle, and uh, all communication is gone. The lines are down. The Internet's gone, and they got to survive, uh, and it doesn't go well. Because there's a family of Bigfoots that live in the woods near Seattle, and their lair has been overtaken by lava, and they have to move eastward. And nobody knows about this family of Bigfoots. There's like two dozen of them. And this commune starts realizing, because they have to make their own food, uh, that the um, berries are gone, and then the chipmunks are gone, and then the deer are gone, and then the mountain lions are gone. And uh, Not the mountain lions. The, yeah, yeah. No, there, there's a scene. Yeah, the mountain lions are gone. And uh, the Bigfoots don't want to eat humans, so they eat everything else. But then everything else is gone, and then it's the last half of the book where the Bigfoots are coming in for the only left food supply is the people. And it's war between these uh, environmentalist uh, uh, pacifists and a family of Bigfoots who just want to eat. And uh, it's a terrific book. Uh, it's the same guy that did uh, Zombie Survival Guide. It takes place in the woods, middle of nowhere, cut off from society. And uh, if you like Bigfoot like I like Bigfoot, and I drive through West Virginia all the time, uh, you, you got to read Devolution by Max Brooks. We interviewed well, him on our podcast. If you, um, that's what I'm talking about, Bill. That's a you, man I can talk to you right there. Yeah. <laughs> and talking about big feats, did you see the size of his hands? Looks like uh, Andre the Giant over there. God. 
God. You know, Christopher, what what you just did? Look at that hand right there, Bill. What you just did, Christopher? Hand right there was like when you accidentally leave food outside on your porch, and uh, this stray cat comes. It just starts coming around every day, and you can't get rid of him. That's what you just did for James. He's gonna yeah. he's gonna follow you everywhere now. He's if, if if you look at all your social media, he's probably already followed you uh, to the I'll ends be of the on earth. your front porch in the morning looking for <laughs> another. I like little Debbie cakes. Good, good, good. You, you know, I, I'm in a Bigfoot movies. I've probably done a two dozen of them on my blog. I just did embedded a found footage one, which is kind of neat. I. Uh, uh, but there's some wonderful Bigfoot. Oh, guaranteed. And there, there's no bigger fan of a creature feature than uh, the, the guy here, James, the godfather of droll. And uh, maybe, maybe my right. stepdad. I like uh, you, creatures. You could add like a, a, a werewolf to any movie in history, and it yeah. would be 10,000 times better for James and my stepdad. Guaranteed. Yeah, I'm gonna- I'm going to post a review soon of a 50-year-old movie called The Werewolf vs. the Vampire Woman. Uh, just classic 1972 drive-in stuff. Um, it is, uh, you know, throw in some Euro babes and uh, a babe vampire, and uh, uh, it's just a wonderful movie. But you're right, you throw a werewolf into anything, uh, it cannot go wrong. Replace Patrick Swayze in Dirty Dancing with a Werewolf. Oh, Absolutely there. not. Academy Award winner. Don't you dare. Replace, uh, replace Shirley MacLaine. in terms of talking about, Bill. talking about. <laughs> this man right here knows what he's talking about, Bill. Oh, I've been trying to lead you down the right path, but you just keep veering away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, uh, <laughs> And I'll tell you this, the babe in the white swimsuit and creature from the Black Lagoon, uh-huh. she would have fared as well if it was a werewolf instead of a creature. Oh, no. Oh, no. No, that, that's a 30-minute short. It could be like a Three Stooges, you know, episode. Yeah. yeah. I met her, by the way, uh, before she died, uh, Julie, Julie Adams. Where did you meet her? Uh, a werewolf well, could have got on that boat said. a lot quicker than the creature from the Black Lagoon. Yeah, that's true. He just sort of waddled along. Um, but uh, uh, Monster Palooza in LA in 2015. I was there for work, and uh, I noticed Monster Palooza was in town, stayed an extra couple of days, and everybody was there. And I just said, because it's expensive, just one one autograph. And I didn't care about Romero, I didn't care about Linda Blair, I didn't care about the cast from Superman Two, didn't care about the cast from Aliens. I wanted the babe in the white swimsuit from Creature from the Black Lagoon, and it was very very sad. Um, everyone else had these big long lines, and there was nobody in her line. And uh, and she would end up dying at the age of ninety about three years later. But uh, classy, classy woman. Wow. Yeah. I mean, those are the ones that you know you you have to. That's a have to. You go to those cons, and you know the long lines are generally going to be for you know the, the most popular, obviously. Right. But sometimes you're just going to find one little you know diamond in the rough over there, and it's like yeah. oh. Well, yeah, I mean, that's yeah. like when I went to the one with uh, with, with Sid Hay. He oh. was there. Nobody was at his table. He's been in Spider Baby, which is an awesome movie. Yeah, let's see. a lot of awesome there. stuff, and nobody was there. And it's like, oh. dude, it's Sid Hay. Do you know who yeah. this is? And everybody's in line for Freddy. Everybody's in line for Linda Blair. Everybody's in line for uh, Adrian Barbeau. And I'm like, are yeah. you serious right now? But, yeah. Oh. Yeah, he, no I appreciation. Heard, if you remember Galaxy of Terror, one of my favorite movies. In fact, my book, Tentacle Invasion, it pays a lot of homage to Galaxy of Terror. Uh, but, uh, oh, yeah. See, I would have been in that Sid Haig line. I would have been there. Yeah. Well, Did you know, moving on died? in the film. Six months ago, eight months ago, Sid Haig died? Yeah. Yes. I think it was like a year yeah. ago. It, yeah, it wasn't yeah, long yeah. at all. Yeah. And a year might be the max. It feels, well, I mean, yeah. time flies, especially during this you know, pandemic. He died two years ago, actually. Good. Oh, wow. wow. Well, it does fly. Ah, uh, boy, I'm next. <laughs> Thinking I'm next, but that's okay. <laughs> no. Probably time for me. Anyway, I, do I have any more, much more usefulness on this planet? I have no idea. I should ask my kids. Because, you know, after a while, people just sort of say they're happy to see you, but, uh, you know, the older you get, you get they can't grouchy. wait to leave. You get cantankerous. Yeah, yeah. That's one stealing one. air away you from the kids. You my vigor in this podcast, sir. Yeah. You're a scholar and a gentleman. Wow. 
coming from him, that doesn't mean much. Okay, you just oh, have to know knows. him. You just have to know that, him. That's a man who knows. Yeah. So technically, you know, I, I keep, we. I, I keep thinking. You watching heard that, Bill? I'm a here. man who knows. Yeah, man who knows. So technically, we can say that Betsy is our final girl because she's the finalist girl. But after a confrontation with Madman Mars in his home and a valiant effort, Betsy shoved on some spikes in a wall. In a last effort, she stabs Mars, who knocks over a candle into the dry hay on the floor, lighting a fire that will undoubtedly destroy the home. And this leaves Richie, who I have no idea where the fuck he's been, but it leaves Richie. Get about it. <clears throat> yeah, you forget all about him. I mean, you, you see him in a couple of scenes here and there, but you, you forget all about him. He makes it to the roadside where he's found by Max. And before credits okay. roll, we can hear Richie declare that Madman Mars, he's real. After he fucking started the whole damn thing. Yeah. After he started the whole thing. And that's what I wanted to get back to. The one that started this shit gets to walk home. Okay, now this is the sequel. It picks up 12 years later. He's drunk out of his mind at a... Uh bar in Tijuana. He's in oh, the yeah. restroom in a puddle of cow urine and beer and oh, he yeah. opens his eyes and sees the beautiful woman walk in with the neon lights in the back radiating through her hair. He stands up realizing he's just a bit of depraved humanity. The girl walks up to him. He's never seen some, someone as beautiful. And then the axe comes flying. The girl's head flies off. And Madman Marks Marks comes to finish the job. Sign me up. Yeah. <laughs> Sign yeah. That's me where the sequel up. needs to start. Yeah. It's better than the refrigerator scene in Friday the 13th part, whatever, where he opens the refrigerator and the lady's head's there, and then she gets, a, I think, a nice pick in the ear or something. I forget. Well, you bite your tongue, sir. That's an outstanding scene. Oh, it is. It is. But this would beat it. Now, Chris, correct me if I'm wrong. Was there supposed to be a second Madman or no? I don't know. Um, um, that's a good question. I would guess there was. Uh, the uh, uh, a lot, a lot of times these questions are answered as far as funding and producers' interest in them. Um, back then, you had to act really, really, really fast because there were two slash movies per week coming out. Uh, 1980, 81, 82, and 83, it slows down a little bit. In 87, it slows down a, a lot more. But in 81, you had to act fast. And you almost sort of had to start production on it within weeks of uh, this one coming out. Oh, wow. So yeah. this one actually did initially have a plan for a sequel, I read. Um, so basically, the ending where they find Richie on the side of the road was supposed to be a setup for a sequel. And mm -hmm. in the sequel, Richie was supposed to be blamed for the murders while Madman continued like running around the woods killing people. I'm okay doing that. So I that. thought that was kind of cool. Do I would do it. And maybe a more choreographed, better hot tub scene. <laughs> maybe. Just maybe. Yeah, synchronized hot tub scene, right. maybe. You know? right. yeah. You're going to have to get, yeah, you're going to have to get a much better director to make that any better. I mean, that's. Here uh, we are talking about it 40 years later. 40 though. years later. So, I mean, yeah. it, it must have done its job, you know. Okay. Yeah. For good, for better or worse. Yeah. yeah. Well, hey, let's go ahead and get our final thoughts on the film Mad Men. Rick, this was your flick, man. Lay it on us. Uh, I mean, to me, like I said before, it's uh, one of my favorite underrated slashers um, that wasn't on the radar and now has a cult following. And uh, for something that came after Friday the 13th and Halloween, it definitely you know, still sticks to me. It's, it's a fun, fun little, good little film, definitely. Casey has Got your really opinion. Huh? Got some really good gore, really good kill scenes. Absolutely. Casey, Great. has your opinion changed whatsoever during this podcast look i'm a woman with strong opinions it's not for me i'll say that there were cool scenes and there were cool moments but it just wasn't for me mm -mm -mm. i need that final girl i guess <laughs> you needed less twirling in the hot tub is what you needed i definitely needed less twirling <laughs> my motion sickness was going <laughs> crazy <laughs> james yes Final thoughts yes. on Madman? You know what? I like this movie pretty good. It's about damn time. It's better than Friday the 13th, I can tell you that. Like hell it is. And I've been Madman uh, two, 2000. <laughs> you could uh, you probably stand some, uh, like some Rocky-type sequels where he's old and training the next madman james you're a sad case sir i can get into a, a madman max uh 
training scene for sure. Eye of the Tiger playing in the background. Christopher, final thoughts on Madman. Yeah, I wrote a review of it uh, many years ago. I think I sent it to you, but um, it's it's I, I liked it a lot. I liked it a lot when I first saw it. I liked it a lot 40 years ago. Um, perfect companion piece to one of my favorite all-time movies, The Burning. Very similar movies that will end very differently. Um, breaking the rules with the final girl. Uh, now, I, I, I sort of think it's brilliant. Back then, it, it was like, like I said, the day that's just been wiped out. But uh, I, I, I liked it a lot. It had a lot of uh, interesting stuff in it for me. One, Galen Ross from Dawn of the Dead was in it uh, under a different name. I had no idea why. A couple of really weird scenes that to this day have not been ex- explained. The hot tub and the the, the cabin scene is just, just weird, but kind of icky, but kind of... Uh, it, it almost justified just killing everybody. You, you, you know, <laughs> if you're going to pull around in a hot tub, you're dead, and your friends are dead, and everybody who ever liked you is dead. That should be a rule. Um, although, like I said, I've never tried it. Um, I'll, I'll see if the wife wants to give it a go. Um, um, I'll let you guys know how that works out. Turn the jets uh, on like so it. you don't have to turn yourself as as, as hard, yeah. you know, just kind of push you around. Yeah, but I liked it. James, what are we watching next week? Nothing. Well, Bill, what would you like to watch? No, no. Oh, no, no, no. It this, doesn't this... matter what you want to watch. Cause I'm... <laughs> watch the bookends or silent scream. I don't know what either one of those are, but it's time for a creature feature. Give it to us. We're okay. watching... Twilight. <laughs> no, it's I'm kidding. Oh, good God. <laughs> Dog soldiers. Yes. Dog yes. soldiers. Okay. Oh, hey, soldiers. calm down, Rick. That yeah. Is a, that is Rick's great, done got fired up. That's a great werewolf movie. That's it. It's the girl. It's the girl. Well, there we Rick's have it. Rick's got fired up over. Yeah, I can hear him breaking out the cocoa butter right now. Well, guys, <laughs> there you have it. We're watching Dog Soldiers this week. So find it, watch it, pick us up next week for Final Girl Casey, for the Memphis Menace Rick, for the Godfather of Droll James, and our special guest Big Christopher Z. is out there and watching all of us. I'm Billy Graves, and this was the Slashers and Screamers podcast. 